Okay, well, I have been asked to make a video of the German field telephones. These are the German FFOBZB. They are manufactured by Standard Electric Lawrence. This particular one was made in November of 1961. And this one was made in April of 1966. Inside we have electrical diagrams made of hard plastic. We have one instruction manual in German, a little clip to retain it, more electrical diagrams. In storage here you have a jumper cable that connects directly between two telephones. And here you have a remote battery adapter. Just one handed here. There we go. You have your receiver. Okay. You have your receiver. And this is a push to talk button. What you would do is you would, when someone's done talking here, they would say over. You would then push this button and talk, and when you're done, you say over and let off. There are five pins, but only these first four actually do anything. This is nothing more than a key pin. There are two sets of plugs, and that is because your phone normally plugs in here. There is an optional headset and microphone with a push-to-talk button that can plug in here. They're very difficult to locate. This part flips down and out. This is where your phone hangs up when you're not using it. Just like that. That opens the circuit. The switch controls the loudness of the ringer. And these are your connection terminals. They are very nice nickel-plated heavy-duty units. Uh, particularly LA in German means a positive connection and LVE means ground. Now I've tried to further highlight that by using red and green electrical tape here. And I've put markings for plus and ground on. And this is your actual battery pack. And it pulls straight out. It has two contacts. A little squeeze ejects the top. It takes two standard D size batteries. The better the quality, of course, the better the runtime you get out of the phone. Which honestly, one pack of batteries is supposed to last couple of months under normal usage. It only requires three volts to power it. Right here is a sheet of rubber along with right here. This is where you always route your cords. So the lid's closed and latched. It could be pouring down rain and rain would not get inside this unit. Over here flips out your ringer. By cranking that is a magneto and it generates between 70 and 100 volts depending on how fast you crank it at approximately 20 hertz alternating current and that's actually just about standard for every field telephone in the world. And it's a little different nowadays but that most any modern field telephone like a TA-312 US Army or anything like that would still respond to it the same way since these are backwards compatible. Carefully under here, there's this teardrop shaped plastic piece. Let's see if I can get a better view of it. It goes out of the way and has two quarter inch phono connectors. This is your jumper cable connection. Plug it until it snaps in. The same on the other one. What this lets you do is link two phones together. So if two people needed to talk to another person to the other end by linking two phones together, they could have a party line communication. 
it connects all the circuitry together just like these would. So if I now crank this one, that one rings. Another crank, this one, that one rings. That's all well and good if you're using two phones at once. Your other option is, of course, to connect two phones together. And what I did was, is by adding red and green electrical tape and also color coding all my wiring red and green makes it very quick and easy to just string out your cable and connect it up. Um, these phones are good for eight kilometers, which is about five miles, but the original wire from my research shows to be about 20 gauge or 22 gauge wire. If you use modern, or more modern, I should say, US military WD-1A, which is what this is. This is about a 16 gauge wire. It has a copper conductor with a special alloy to it, and it has stainless, it has a um, galvanized steel strands around it making it about a 16 gauge together this wire here if been pulled together has a 200 foot pound breaking force on it so you have to put 200 pounds of pull on it to bust this wire so it's excellent for laying and it's cheap you can get it off the internet you can get a half kilometer spool for like 30 dollars and about another 15 to 20 to ship it because it weighs pretty good um, it's very tough the jacket is made of nylon and polyethylene it is extremely tough. Regular wire cutters normally go right through most wires. This stuff, you have to put the wire cutter and spin it around a couple times to chew through it. The terminals, once you screw these up, there's actually a hole, which is hard to visualize. There's a hole right through here. You put your wire through. Oh, God, that cat's in. You run your wires through. Positive and negative. One other technique you can do is if you don't have enough two-strand wire to do this and you need to set up two field phones in emergency communication, you can actually split your wires and connect them end to end to make one long wire and connect your positive to your positive and you take your ground. And instead of connecting it to the ground wire, you run a short wire to a ground rod in damp soil on both ends. It is single wire grounded communication it's not recommended. The quality will not be good. There'll be a lot of echoes due to signal bounce. And the other side effect is, is that if this is like several miles that you do this in, the enemy could get in your line of sight between your two phones and plunge a ground rod into the ground and using a portable amplifier with a battery could actually listen in on your communications through what's called ground waves. It's There's not a lot of information on how to do this, but from what I've been able to gather, um, if you have an old Heath kit vacuum tube uh, signal tracer, you could technically do it with that if you had a portable battery to power it. Um, the neat thing about these phones is they are compatible with anything that was made in the same time period from the United States. I have, uh, in another video, I'll show you my SB22A PT um, tactical switchboard. It has 12 lines in it. I uh, modified it by pulling out one line pack and replacing a trunk pack so you can actually patch it into the uh, uh, common POTS telephone telco systems in any house. And you can actually uh, pick up a phone call or even make a phone call if you can add a dialing pad to it, which there is one available, but it's hard to locate. Uh, these phones can be connected directly to your telephone line in your house. And if you crank your ringer, it's the same compatible with your phone. It will make a phone in your house ring. Um, if somebody calls you, the ringer in here will ring. The only difference is that when you pick up your phone and you answer it to talk, you have to push the button. A lot of people wonder how the insides of these phones work. Um, Here's the voice piece. If you're wondering what that gray slime is, that's actually Nolox or uh, another antioxidant compound I like to put on contacts to prevent oxidation and corrosion. I put it on light bulbs so they don't get stuck in the socket. That in particular is your carbon microphone. It works using basically two metal plates and electrical current flows through it. 
you can't hear this one. Sometimes when you shake them, you can hear it rattling. All there is is, is uh, activated carbon dust in there. Uh, small granules, probably about twice the size of sugar cubes, more like coarse sea salt. When you talk, the carbon bounces around in there and fluctuates the current flowing through it. It's got a limited, vo limited pretty much to vocal range. It doesn't work too much above or below it. And all it does is rest on those contacts, just like that. And it's actually held in with this. Put this back together here. piece is nothing more than a simple diaphragm, electromagnetic diaphragm speaker. What's nice is, is all this is interchangeable and easily replaced with a minimum of tools of just a couple different size regular screwdrivers is about all you need to take it apart and do maintenance on it. Um, if the contacts on things are dirty like they were on a lot of this stuff because of the age, they're all made of hard yellow brass. So all I did was take either steel wool or like a thousand grit sandpaper and clean all the, all the contacts and coat them. And then coat them with an antioxidant compound, which you can get at any home improvement store's electrical department. I like uh, Noel Ox, but Ox Guard by Gardner and Bender is just fine. And there's all kinds of other ones out there available. And uh, they'll prevent the co contacts from getting corroded again. Uh, ringers sometimes need adjusting. I am not going to take this phone apart, but if you, these screws that are ringed in red right here, here, there, and there, if you undo those, the case comes apart to two sections, and you can get to the ringer unit. Usually all it takes is loosening a single screw on the ringer bell and twisting the ringer bell causes it to move inward and outward away from the ringer clapper. That's all you got to do. Just adjust it until it makes the loudest sound when loud, tighten it down, and you should be good. Um, about four of my seven phones that needed adjustment. One was misadjusted at the factory and basically never worked, apparently. It still had their version of Loctite on it. These do come with a user's manual but it's all in German. Uh, what I wound up doing is making some notes on it. This particular manual is 1958. And I use Google Translate to fill in the blanks. My German's pretty rusty. And these are local battery phones. Uh, some newer field phones like the TA312s that the U.S. military uses and, and newer ones have a local battery or common battery mode. Common battery mode means they use a, a um, switchboard that has a high power battery in it to supply power to all phones connected to it and that's just like a modern telephone system. Uh, local battery means each phone has its own battery pack and that's basically how the phones in the 1930s worked. They had a battery in them and a high voltage ringer, just like a ringing crank generator like this one. As you can see, if you run your wires, we'll just lay this in here to show if it'll cooperate. And you close this lid. I mean, really, if you think about it, the way they've designed it, rain can pour down on top of all this and nothing will get inside. And then when you're done, you hang it up so it'll ring. Even the generator is shielded. It has a rubber sleeve that protects it. So it's actually pretty weather resistant. Short of horizontal rain coming in, you're okay. If you need to hook this up to a higher power battery pack, you can do it like this. This plug right here reach down in there and drop it in place. You can either, this was actually made to go to a high power battery pack. Good luck finding them. They were not like, a, they weren't like a stack of D-cell batteries. They were similar to a liquid, uh, a wet lead acid battery for three volts at a much higher current rating. So they would run for like, could probably run for up to a year with limited use without a problem. Um, 
one modification you could do is to cut this off right here and replace it with a 5.5 millimeter by 2.1 millimeter um, female inline power adapter and that would let you then couple it to a AC power supply that converts down to 3 volts DC at a couple hundred milliamps of regulated DC current. Now make sure you get one that's got good regulation on it otherwise you're going to hear a lot of hum and buzz in your phone circuit from any AC noise. And it's easy to filter out DC, it's a little bit harder to filter out AC you know, after the fact. You could also make yourself an adapter to a simple voltage regulator using one of the LM series voltage regulators and hook it up to like, if it gets like an LM317T and adjust it for a 3 volt clean output, you could put anywhere from 6 to 60 volts into that thing and get 3 volts output to power this so you could hook it into any DC power source you wanted to. It's a snug fit down there. In uh, part two, I'll show you my SB22 switchboard and how we hook into it. Thank you very much.